This is a production of Cornell University. So the first thing I want to do is to thank all of you for coming uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. And uh, in the next, I would say, a little over than half an hour or 40 minutes, I'd like to talk a little bit about mycorrhizae. And uh, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with mycorrhizae, and I see some uh, familiar faces uh, here uh, who work with uh, mycorrhizae. So I'd like to approach this area from commercial standpoint a little bit. So you would have an idea of, you know, at mycorrhizal applications, how we um, handle this uh, topic and what kind of research uh, we do here. So just as an introduction, um, mycorrhizal fungi form symbiosis uh, with plants. And uh, most of the plants have this ability to form uh, symbiosis. Over 90% of the land plants um, reported to form symbiosis. And they live in the soil and uh, they interact with the roots. So they don't go to the leaves and uh, any other parts uh, of the plant. Mycorrhizae provides a better absorption of nutrients and increase the water uptake uh, to the plant. And this is the benefit for the plant from the mycorrhizae. However, this is not free. So the fungus requires uh, from the plant uh, to provide uh, carbon in return. So this is some kind of a uh, realistic uh, relationship, a symbiosis between the plant and the fungus, where both of, both of the uh, participants have uh, benefits. They cannot function without living plants. And this is very important um, from commercial standpoint when, uh, when you apply like uh, mycorrhizal inoculum and there's no plant in the soil, you don't really see the benefits of mycorrhizae because there's no plant uh, to interact with um, the fungus. Not only the plants control this symbiosis, so when um, the plants um, are under stressful conditions like drought stress or nutrient stress, they produce root exudates that triggers mycorrhizal spores to germinate. So this is how you know, the symbiosis uh, starts to form. They uh, increase the nutrient and the water absorption um, for the plants by increasing the absorption zone. And this is not just increasing the root biomass, biomass but also form a mycelium around the root zone it actually expands or extends this absorption area. And uh, I'm gonna have a couple of slides about this, you know, what the details are of, um, of this uh, aspect. So they increase the tolerance to various stressors like drought stress, uh, salt stress, salinity stress, um, heavy metal toxicity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this as well. And there are different types of mycorrhizae that exist and uh, so the most important ones are endomycorrhizae or arbuscular mycorrhizae. They got their name after uh, their relationship, structural relationship with the plant. So actually they penetrate inside the cortical cells of the plant roots. That's why they are called endomycorrhizae because they go inside the cells. They are called arbuscular mycorrhizae as well. And most of the agricultural, horticultural plants belong to this um, category or form symbiosis with this type of mycorrhizae. There's another type of mycorrhizae called ectomycorrhizae that actually do not uh, penetrate inside the cortical cells. They form a mantle um, around the roots and uh, they, they form the symbiosis or they form their hyphae um, in the intercellular spaces of the roots and they are ectomycorrhizae. They, they live in symbiosis with hardwoods, uh, forest trees, um, pines, spruces, for example. There's a very specific kind, uh, actually a subtype of ectomycorrhizae, ectendomycorrhizae. They represent only a very tiny portion uh, of, the, of the plants and the symbiosis. Orchids have a specific type of mycorrhizae. They're called orchid mycorrhizae. So they do not form symbiosis with ectomycorrhizae, for example. Ericaceous plants like uh, blueberries, azalea, or rhododendron, they form symbiosis with ericaceous mycorrhizae. That's a very specific uh, type of mycorrhizae. And uh, there are very, very tiny uh, portions 
um, like only one genus or one plant species that uh, forms symbiosis with Arbutus plants or Monotropa, the ghost plant. They represent only a very tiny portion. So these are just to mention, but, uh, but the main uh, types are endomycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, these today, focusing on endomycorrhizae. So when we talk about endomycorrhizae, uh, we know that they form symbiosis with a large number of plants. Um, over 80% of the plants form symbiosis with them. And uh, as I mentioned, they colonize the, the, the roots inside the, or colonize the plants inside the roots. And uh, so it's not that easy to recognize just by looking at the plants, if the plant is colonized or not. So what we have to do uh, is we have to collect the roots, um, clear them, stain them, and evaluate them under the microscope. And uh, so this is just an example how um, a prepared root sample looks like. So when we, when we clear the roots and, um, and stain them, this is what we see, uh, that there's practically nothing really, nothing interesting in the roots. However, when we look at a root with uh, uh, mycorrhizae, what you can see that uh, you see different structures uh, inside the, the roots. These are spores and vesicles that are storage organs uh, for the mycorrhizae and also uh, mycelium uh, inside the, uh, the roots and uh, arbuscules. So these are tiny uh, like tree-like uh, structures that are actually responsible for the exchange of nutrients uh, between the fungus and the plant. Um, and yeah, basically this is uh, how we evaluate uh, different plants to detect the presence of mycorrhizae. There's another kind of mycorrhizae, ectomycorrhizae, that forms symbiosis with less than 10% of uh, plant species and, and, and the major host plants are coniferous or deciduous trees, um, spruce, spruces, pine trees um, that form symbiosis. And uh, these are actually mushrooms that form uh, fruiting bodies in the forest. So when you walk in the forest and you see uh, different trees, you see that ectomycorrhizae or, or mushrooms uh, form on the surface of the ground. And they are every time connected, interconnected with, uh, with the plants around them. So that's a very interesting um, phenomenon. And when we compare the ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae in terms of uh, appearance, you can actually see the, uh, the difference in root morphology because the roots normally uh, look a bit different. So this is uh, a very nice example, the fly agaric um, for ectomycorrhizae. And, uh, and when you look at the roots, these are colonized by ectomycorrhizae physolithus uh, tinctorius in this case, and uh, this is non-colonized. So it actually really uh, visible in, in case of ectomycorrhizae, how larger the root uh, could be or how their morphology could change just by the colonization of this fungus. And this really helps in imp increasing the absorption area of the roots and taking up more nutrients and water from the soil. When you look at, uh, take a look at the uh, roots and uh, this is particularly true for endomycorrhizae. So these are the roots and uh, and these are the fungal mycelium or, or, or hyphae around the roots and some spores, uh, what you can see as well. So the mycorrhizae form this symbiosis and they live inside the roots and also outside the roots. Um, they form, some species can form uh, spores outside the roots and some species inside the roots and most of them actually do both. So when we talk about mycorrhizae from commercial standpoint, growers always ask why, why, uh, why plants need mycorrhizae. So they have roots and uh, couldn't just they uh, take up nutrients and water efficiently without mycorrhizae. And uh, so we try to explain the difference, uh, the structural and functional benefits, uh, what mycorrhizae can provide when we compare the root hair and the mycorrhizal fungal hyphae. So 
when we look at the roots, this is a plant root uh, here, and this is the root hair that actually is responsible for taking up most of the nutrients and the water. And uh, the maximum length of the root hair is only a few millimeters. So that's, that's a very tiny area or, so, or soil volume that they can explore to take up the nutrients and the water. And the cation absorption occurs only at the root tips. So the absorption is only at the root tips. So that's a very tiny area for nutrient and water uptake. And uh, another important thing that we have to consider is that the nutrient uptake is normally from the available or, or easily soluble pool uh, of the soil and of the soil uh, uh, nutrients. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, in a minute. And because of this uh, tiny absorption area at the root tips, the nutrient inflow into the roots is normally slower, much slower than the mycorrhizal hyphae. Because when we, when we look at the mycorrhizal hyphae um, or the network of mycorrhizal hyphae in the roots, um, we see a huge difference uh, from, uh, from plant roots. Because what you can see here is this is a root, a feeder root, that is responsible for, uh, for nutrient uptake. And this network of mycelium around it are mycorrhizae. And what you have to uh, see here is that maximum length could be up to two feet. So basically what happens is they can extend this uh, depletion zone, we call it depletion zone, where the nutrients and the water uptake occurs by two feet, which, is, which could be extremely important under drought conditions. And the nutrient and the water absorption occurs along the entire length of the hyphae. So it's not just the tips, but the entire length could take up nutrients and water. So that's a, that's a huge increase in absorption area. Mineral nutrient uptake from the soluble and insoluble pool. So I just have to mention that they uh, produce enzymes uh, like phosphatases that uh, helps uh, solubilizing uh, phosphate and uh, easier to take up for the plants. And also they take up uh, nutrients and transport it to the plant as well. And because of this increased absorption area or absorptive area, the nutrient inflow into the hyphae and uh, from the hyphae to the plant is much faster, much quicker compared to the uh, root uptake. So this is why, uh, and this is how mycorrhizae uh, increases the nutrient and the water uh, uptake of the plant. And under field conditions, when we, when we look at you know, mycorrhizae you know, and how it works, and, and this is what I was just talking about, that there's a root zone where you know, the majority, uh, it's soil volume where the majority of the roots are located and, and, and take up the nutrients and the water and uh, what mycorrhizae does it extends the soil volume and uh, this is how they can provide benefits and this is very important for those nutrients that are relatively that have relatively low mobility like phosphorus primarily and some of the micronutrients um, because they cannot just move easily uh, into that depletion zone so that's that's very important and this this is very helpful um, for the plant. And then again, this is for field conditions. So when there's a possibility for the roots or the mycorrhizae to explore a larger soil volume. However, there are certain conditions when, um, when there's just no, it's not an option to explore a larger soil volume because there's just no more soil. And this is particularly true for potting uh, conditions when and the plants are grown in a pot and, uh, and they form this, um, these roots and you know, these are root bound, root bound situations. So mycorrhizae still provides uh, the benefits even though there's, uh, there's no uh, larger soy volume to explore. So they produce enzymes that convert nutrients into bioavailable forms. So I just mentioned the phosphatases and they also trigger uh, the production of solubilizing enzymes uh, by the plant roots, so they increase this activity 
um, through the plants. And uh, they also work together with other soil microorganisms to convert uh, insoluble minerals into soluble forms. So these are called uh, mycorrhizal helper bacteria, for example, that live together in symbiosis with the mycorrhizae and uh, help uh, solubilizing non-soluble uh, nutrients. And due to these uh, mechanisms, they reduce nutrient leaching out of the pots. And uh, there's an excellent uh, study that actually looked at um, the effect of mycorrhizal, appli mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal fungal application on, in potting soil conditions when they grew uh, ornamental plants and they looked at nitrogen uh, or nitrate and orthophosphate leaching out of the plants. And uh, this is a busy slide, or this is a busy slide with three graphs. What, what I just want to point out here that these are, these graphs show different fertilizer levels. So Osmocote is a um, fertilizer. It's a slow release fertilizer. And uh, then half rate and full rate of uh, fertilizer. So what you can see here is that the white diamonds on the top in uh, all graphs show that when uh, mycorrhizae was not applied, that's the untreated control, and the black uh, diamonds or black squares show um, the mycorrhizae application. So you can compare the amount of nitrate leached out of the pots. So this shows that my, just by the application of mycorrhizal fungi, fungi reduced the leaching or uh, yeah, practically the leaching of nitrogen or, or, or the loss of nitrogen in these uh, conditions. So this is very important that, uh, that mycorrhizae helps a better absorption of the nutrients to the plants and the plants can utilize these. And, and it's a similar trend with part of orthophosphate. So this is a phosphorus. Um, source, same thing. Um, without mycorrhizae, the phosphorus, the amount of phosphorus that leached out of the pots was, um, I would say, about twice as much as uh, with mycorrhizae. So this is, um, this is something that is, is, is very important, uh, and not just in pot conditions, but also in uh, sites where, where leaching of, of nutrients into the soil or the, or the water um, is a problem. So we talked a little bit about uh, plants that form symbiosis with mycorrhizae, but there are some plants that do not form uh, this symbiosis. They just don't have the ability. And um, prime examples are the Brassicaceae family plants, like cabbage, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, mustard. So these are, these are very good examples. They just don't, do not form this symbiosis and there are different hypotheses why they do not form this symbiosis. Um, the most probable reason is that they lost through the evolution their ability to form uh, this uh, symbiosis. Beets, also a good example. Spinach as well um, from ornamentals, carnation is uh, also a good example uh, for the plants that do not form this, uh, this type of symbiosis and pigweed, some uh, weeds as well. So you can find examples from every areas uh, of the plant. And, uh, but these are the most um, important ones. And when we, when we try to explain uh, you know, why mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal uh, inoculum uh, and mycorrhizal inoculation is important and how we do it in, in, in commercial situations. Um, we normally talk about inoculant technology and I summarized the, uh, the basics uh, here on this slide. So when we talk about inoculation, what we do is we provide a direct contact of the roots with the mycorrhizal fungal inoculum. We call it propagules because these are uh, structures that could be used to propagate or re-inoculate uh, uh, the plants with mycorrhizae. So these are spores and colonized root fragments that we normally uh, refer to in commercial practice. And I'm gonna have a slide on this. 
So it's very important to have a close or direct contact of the inoculum with the roots because the root exudates trigger the mycorrhizal spores to germinate. Mycorrhizal colonization lasts, in most cases, for the life of the plants. So in perennial crops, this means that you have to inoculate only once in their life. And uh, this inoculation could take place at any time, the best, you know, when the, there's active root growth. But with annual plants, um, you have to re-inoculate the plants, or not re-inoculate, just do the inoculation every time when you seed or when there's a new crop coming up. The most economic benefits and best physiological responses can be achieved by early application. So what, what, do, you, what do I mean by that? It means that you know, the earlier you apply the mycorrhizae, the most benefits you're gonna get out because there's gonna be a longer period of time for the mycorrhizae to provide the benefits. And also in, in, in commercial conditions, what happens is we have a recommended rate, like X number of propagules to apply per plant. And when the plants are smaller, you have a smaller root zone. So you, you can get away with smaller amounts of, of mycorrhizal inoculum to uh, get the same colonization or the same uh, inoculum benefits. So that's, it's not just cheaper, but it's better, better from a uh, from physiological standpoint as well. We normally say that it requires one month, three, four weeks for the symbiosis to establish, well established on the roots, and uh, two months, seven or eight weeks to see the benefits from inoculations. So when, when we are talking about these um, time frames, we have to consider, you know, from commercial standpoint, that when we try to apply mycorrhizae in a crop that, that is only like a very short cycle, uh, like three or four weeks, we might not be able to see the benefits because there's just not enough time for the mycorrhizae to provide uh, this extra uh, benefit to the plant. And the good thing is, you cannot overdose with mycorrhizal fungi because um, they're just gonna sit in the soil and, and uh, eaten by, uh, by some, uh, uh, some uh, animals in the soil. But uh, you know, if the plants don't need uh, this symbiosis, they just uh, won't form um, the symbiosis. They just won't germinate in the soil. There are four main uh, benefits that, um, that we normally mention when we talk about mycorrhizal inoculants. And uh, one is increased root growth. So they extend the, um, the absorption area, you know, uh, by this uh, formation of, of mycelium, but also at the same time, they help in uh, increasing the root biomass. And this is particularly important in those crops where the, where the root is the yield. So for example, in potato, onion, and carrot, we see great benefits of uh, using mycorrhizae to increase the, uh, the root biomass. Increased nutrient and uh, water uptake. So this is through the, through the increased absorption uh, area and um, also increasing the bioavailability of nutrients and allowing for reduced irrigation and better fertilizer efficiency. So um, there are several papers out there that shows the benefits of you know, applying mycorrhizae with reduced rates of fertilizers, but uh, um, as a company, we are not really uh, allowed to say that you can reduce the fertilizer because you know, if we promote, let's say, a mycorrhizal inoculant, then other companies will not get any benefits by you know, selling fertilizer products. So we have to be very careful how we word, uh, you know, these um, claims. But uh, what we can say is that they in increase or improve the, the, the nutrient absorption efficiency of the plant. Increased stress tolerance under drought, heat, and toxic levels of minerals. And um, so it's very, um, it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon what, how mycorrhizae can help in, uh, in alleviating toxic levels of minerals because what happens is the mycorrhizal fungi take up the nutrients, uh, the, the, the toxic nutrients from the soil 
but they just don't transport it to the plant. So this is how they actually protect the plant because what happens is if the plant senses that you know, there is no benefit of this symbiosis or this relationship, then they just uh, try to shut down um, this mechanism or this symbiosis. So that's why the, the fungus won't really uh, transport these toxic uh, levels of minerals to the plants. Otherwise, the plant would shut down the symbiosis. And reduce the transplant shock. So transplanting is the most stressful condition or, or phase um, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a plant's life. And uh, the application of mycorrhizae really um, helps and, and, uh, and under these stressful conditions. But uh, as I mentioned here, best if inoculated well before transplanting because, so remember it takes like three, four weeks for the symbiosis to form. And uh, if we apply the mycorrhizae at a seeding stage, so by the time the transplanting happens, the, the mycorrhizae is there and can provide the benefits. So that's, uh, that's an important uh, thing. There are other uh, documented benefits um, that I, I just want to briefly mention here is increased tolerance to pests and pathogens. So there's a resistance called uh, systemic resistance called uh, mycorrhizae induced resistance. There are several publications out there that shows that, uh, for example, chewing insects um, uh, are one of their targets. So when mycorrhizae colonizes the plants, the plants become more resistant uh, to these uh, insects, for example. But these are, this is not something that you can find on a product label for mycorrhizal products because this is not, well, this requires, uh, this would require uh, registration as a pesticide product, which mycorrhizae is not. And uh, there are also more effective, more efficient uh, solutions out there like different pesticides or insecticides that can take care of the problem. We just mentioned here that this is something that you can consider as a positive, let's say side benefit, but these are not real. So mycorrhiza, mycorrhiza is not really um, applied to, uh, to solve these problems or to control insects, for example. Another very important uh, aspect is seed production and offspring fertility. Um, it's been noted that uh, when there's a plant that is colonized by mycorrhizae and is producing seeds, the seeds uh, from these mother plants are going to have a better fertility and a better germination rate compared to those that came from mother plants that were not colonized by mycorrhizae. So this has something to do with uh, the increased nutrient and phosphorus content of the seeds. And uh, this is just something that is, uh, that is very interesting to, uh, to mention. Also increased secondary metabolite production in some plants. Um, they positively affect active in ingredient production of medicinal plants. There are uh, several um, uh, studies showing that terpenes, phenols, and alkaloids uh, are increased by after the application of uh, mycorrhizae. And last but not least, uh, increased soil quality. So the production of glomalin, this is a um, compound that uh, increased the aggregation of soil particles. So this is very important to, uh, to maintain and improve the soil uh, health uh, by mycorrhizae. So why is mycorrhizal inoculation beneficial? Normally under certain, under natural conditions, mycorrhizae is always in the soil. Um, there's just a wide range of species um, there and they provide benefits. Um, but there are growing conditions that are harmful to mycorrhizae. So for example, fumigation, um, over fertilization with nitrogen or phosphorus are especially detrimental to uh, mycorrhizae. And, uh, you know, like tillage following and, and, and stressful environments, particularly roadsides when they put a lot of salt out, you know, around the roads in the winter just to melt the ice that is very um, harmful to mycorrhizae. And certainly artificial growing media, they just by nature don't contain any mycorrhizae and they can, uh, they can be, uh, mycorrhizae can be applied under these conditions. And um, 
so once they deplete it in the soil, it just takes time for the natural population to build up again, and, and that's why it's important to, um, to apply mycorrhizae. And these are just a, a few photos that, uh, to illustrate where mycorrhizae could be um, uh, beneficial. So in fumigated soils, uh, fumigation kills most of the soil microorganisms. Uh, Over-fertilization is not uh, positive, uh, particularly nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, for mycorrhizae and bare root trees or, or, or transplants are particularly good subjects uh, for the use of, uh, of mycorrhizae and artificial growing media. It's uh, something where there's mycorrhizae naturally is not there. Specificity of mycorrhizae. So there's a great deal of variability and uh, what we know that um, one species of mycorrhizae can form the symbiosis with multiple species of plants. And at the same time, um, one plant root could form symbiosis with different species of mycorrhizae. So there's, there's just a great deal of variability, but there are different species that are responsible for different functional benefits. So one species is better for phosphorus uptake. However, other species of mycorrhizae is better uh, to, to uh, increase heavy metal toxicity uh, or uh, to increase the tolerance to heavy metal toxicity. So there are uh, differences in terms of species and fungal species change with plant phenology and plant physiology. So um, the, the composition or the chemical composition of the root exudates change over time uh, and even within the season and also the environmental conditions uh, change. So the, the, the community composition changes um, during the season. I'm gonna have a slide uh, about it. So that's why the diversity of mycorrhizal um, inoculants or microbial inoculants is important to provide a range of species. And uh, so under different conditions, different species can uh, provide uh, the different benefits. And this is just a quick uh, review of uh, one of the products actually that uh, mycorrhizal application sells, it's, it's a microapply that contains four different species where we compiled a or reviewed the literature and uh, nearly 600 uh, papers and uh, we just collected or listed those that, uh, that uh, you know, what species is responsible for what functional benefits and you can see that you know, different, different species uh, provide different benefits. And for example, in, in, uh, in case of uh, Glomus massiae, in nutrient uptake, enzyme activity increase, increases excess micronutrient uptake. There's 11 papers showing the benefits for Glomus massiae and some interadices and, and, and Glomus citrinicatum. So um, that's just important and, and, and interesting to see that different species uh, provide different functional benefits. And this is just one slide uh, from a one graph from a paper where, uh, where uh, they evaluated two natural habitats of, of natural habitats of two species. Um, so you can see two bars here and uh, the community composition over time from July to the following June. And what you can see here is the different colors show different genotype or different species, we can call it different species of, of mycorrhizae. And, and you can see that the, color, the colors change within the season. So that's important that there's a change in diversity uh, of mycorrhizal species uh, with the plant. So they, you know, in the winter and in the summer, there are different uh, composition of this uh, mycorrhizal community. And this is just one uh, photo where there's a comparison with a single species and the, and the multiple species. You can see the, uh, the difference in, uh, in growth. And this is a grass, uh, in case of a grass. Inoculum in mycorrhizal products, so we call them propagules. And there are two main uh, types of propagules, colonized root fragments that contain spores and, and, and hyphae and uh, other mycorrhizal structures and they normally faster in establishing the relationship to colonize the, um, the plant roots and also fungal spores. So spores are normally in the dormant stage and germinate a little bit uh, slower than 
um, than these root fragments. So these are the uh, two main types of, uh, of propagules in, in commercial products. And uh, last but not least, um, a couple of slides on the ways of application, how mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal inoculum could be applied. So in, uh, in horticulture, uh, they could be applied by uh, just spreading or spraying in the uh, in the planting hole. So this is a very efficient way of of uh, uh, inoculating the plants because it provides a direct contact with the roots. So when when the plants are uh, planted in this hole, they are going to be in direct contact with the roots, and and that's very important. It could be incorporated in the growing media before or at planting and mostly granular or powder product um, could come into account. But the most important thing is that, that um, you have to provide a very good blending or mixing with the, um, with the growth medium because what happens is these tiny cells where the, where the plants or the seeds are gonna be uh, seeded, they are gonna contain only two or three propagules on average. So that's really, really hard to achieve. Um, under commercial conditions to have a very, um, very uniform blending. Root dipping. Um, this is particularly with, um, with uh, perennial crops like grapes or, or apple trees, for example, before planting. So uh, growers can just mix up a bucket of water with some uh, mycorrhizal inoculum and dip it in um, in this solution, dip the plants into this solution, and this is how they provide the direct contact uh, before planting. And uh, the only thing that you have to be aware is that the, the propagule tends, tends to settle in the bottom of the bucket, so uh, you just have to shake it or, or mix it um, with the water. And uh, the same thing could be done by a backpack sprayer just spraying directly on the on the roots. Mycorrhizal inoculum could be applied through irrigation, could be overhead or, or drip irrigation, depends on the crop. And uh, the best is, uh, is to water uh, before, uh, before application to wet the soil profile and the mycorrhizae. Just these mycorrhizal propagules are normally pretty small, uh, less than 300, sometimes 200 microns. So they easily travel through the soil, the wet uh, soil profile. So they can get into the um, into the root zone. And seed treatment. Some some products already contain uh, mycorrhizae on their seed coat. So right after germination in the soil, uh, the mycorrhizae is there. The mycorrhizal fungus is there uh, to form the symbiosis with uh, these germinating seeds and uh, powder products could be very popular or in some cases when uh, like alfalfa uh, they mix the seeds with uh, granular products because the size of the seed is the same as the granular size so they can just uh, spread or uh, sprinkle together and I think that's what I had for today thank you that's where we see the most benefits yes when the conditions are optimal let's say um, an optimum irrigation or fertilization you know the plants won't really need too much help uh, to absorb more nutrients or water so we see mo most benefits Yes. 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 There are different formulations. Yeah, that contains four, five, or nine species. Yes. Uh, Joseph, can you ask Geneva if they have any questions? Geneva uh, campus, do you have any questions? We do. Great talk. Here we go. So uh, if you're dealing with a, an apple tree coming uh, bare root from a nursery man, is it uh, quite good to just have the nursery man inoculate the roots or is it much better to wait until they are just going into the ground? 
as, as early as possible. So if they can apply it at the nursery, that's gonna be uh, a much better solution because by the time it is transplanted into the field, they can provide the benefits and the, and the symbiosis has been already formed by the time. Thank you. Uh, quick question about brassicas. I've also heard that there's you know, scarcity of uh, symbiotic relationships. Has, are you aware of any studies where they've tested older germplasm or even sort of the wild progenitors for symbiotic relationships? Uh, in what plant species? Brassica. Oh, Brassica. No, no. I am not aware. Cool. Thank you. Although I, I, I recall uh, reading a paper about a Brassica that, um, that they found a very mild colonization uh, at their later stage of their life, uh, just before senescence, uh, which was very uh, interesting, um, but I don't really uh, remember any, any germplasm tests or... Thank you. When were um, mycorrhizae first identified and when was their mechanism first uh, explained? Well, I think it was the late uh, 1800s when they uh, named um, uh, mycorrhizae and uh, in the, I would say, in the 30s or 40s, uh, 1900s, 1930s or 40s when they started to recognize because earlier they thought that uh, they actually uh, have a negative effect on uh, on the plants and they didn't really look at uh, look at like growth response and uh, what happened is um, well they certainly didn't look at uh, nutrient uptake and, and nutrient content of the of the leaves but um, in the 40s when they started to recognize um, the benefits. I'm curious about the shelf life of these um, organisms in packaged potting mix, because some of the artificial mix formulators um, are, are incorporating various kinds of mycorrhizae, and how, how long would those mycorrhizae stay active in a you know, prepared potting mix before any plant gets put into it? Well, uh, dry and granular formulations have a two-year shelf life. This is required uh, from uh, state regulators. However, when it's mixed in uh, with, uh, with the soil, everything depends on the moisture content of the soil. So if it's a low moisture content, it's going to have a longer shelf life let's say one year or up to two years. However, it has a, if it has a high moisture content, um, over 40%, that could uh, reduce the shelf life significantly to even six months or, or one year. It depends on the, the components. And temperature, I suppose, would have a big effect on that too. Yes, the storage conditions. Any other questions? Maria? Um, I was curious what you see as the biggest challenge for the industry. For the micro, mycorrhizal inoculant industry? What I think is, um, is probably the high number of, of uh, companies that are popping up right now because it's really easy. So I didn't talk about the production. Uh, of mycorrhizae. So there is in vitro and in vivo production. In vitro is in the, happens in the lab, in vivo is out the field. And uh, in vivo production is really relatively easy uh, to do. And uh, smaller companies tend to start because it's start to grow mycorrhizae on their own and without any, uh, any quality control, any uh, field trial testing, they, they market their product and uh, they, they put everything on the label that has been published for different species of mycorrhizae. So what happens is that reduce the, reduces the credibility of, uh, of the larger producers and uh, because, you know, it's just really hard to control. And I, and I see that's the most important problem to, um, 
to to stay credible and and just put um, you know those claims on the label that you have been tested because most of the companies don't really have a budget to um, execute a large scale field trial program to um, to test it in corn to test it in um, um, in various species and uh, that creates some kind of attention because you know there are hundreds of products out there but growers just don't know which one to choose because the, the information is just not out there so i i, I see that's that's uh that's a main uh issue right now i think we have time for one more question yeah kind of following up on the mycorrhizae added to growing mixes or these you know garden center bags of mycorrhizae how do you know that it'll work for what you want to be growing you know is it or is it wasted on you know maybe these species don't work for tomatoes or trees or... yes actually that's that's another uh main problem that i have to mention because um you know some companies just put a lot of things uh, in in uh, in potting mixes for example both ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae, and uh, certainly, you know, the potting mix that is uh, labeled for, I don't know, um, vegetable uh, use, you know, there's ectomycorrhizae in it. You just pay for ectomycorrhizae. It's never gonna do anything or any harm, any good. And uh, that's, that's a problem. Um, I see that, that there are several products out there that, that are marketed for, uh, specific uses but not the right components are there not the right species for example um, there are products out there for ericaceous particularly ericaceous uh, plants blueberries and uh, there's just ectomycorrhizae in it and uh, it just won't help so that's 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 kind of a problem so did, it, did it answer your question I'm sorry or, or how do you find out what oh how do you find well, I think it's it's best to to call the manufacturer and 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 get the information directly from them, uh, because you know if there's a um, a credible company, so they should have a technical uh, support um, uh, department where they can provide you know all this information. But you can certainly look it up online on the internet and and, and find papers. But the easiest is just to talk to them directly and uh, and get the information firsthand from from them. So we've run out of time, um, but I do want to again remind graduate students, if you'd like to continue the dialogue with Dr. Roxbo, um, we will be in room 22, plant science, starting in 10 minutes or less. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.